Okay, and we're now live. Okay, excellent. So I just like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. I briefly said that um, we do have a pretty packed agenda tonight and some very good substantive uh, topics on here want to do them justice. So let's um, go. Oh, there's Ezra joining us. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do the roll call just yet just to stay yet. here. So uh, Donna. Here. Ezra. Just made it. There he did. Doug. Here. Paul. I'm here. Ray. Ray. I but need to be let in. Oh, we saw you, but I can't, you're here. Good turn. Yeah. Here. Okay. And then David Sandino. Here. Excellent. All right. Um, with that, and I'm Michelle Weiss, and I'm here. Donna has pointed out to me that oftentimes I forget to uh, vote or, or uh, be clear that, yes, I am here. Um, so I think everybody's had time to look at the agenda. Does anybody have any changes they'd like to make? If not, I don't see anybody with that. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll, so, oh, I'll second Ray's motion. Excellent. All right. So now I'm going to have to do a roll call vote. Michelle. Yes. Aye. Fine. Uh, Donna. Aye. Ezra. Aye. Doug. Aye. Paul. Aye. Ray. Aye. Gerker. Aye. Excellent. Okay. So with that, let's go to any brief announcements um, from staff commissioners and liaisons, I will point out that in the brief announcements you have in your packet, the Q1, the budget update. Um, I asked Elena, she's going to be presenting tomorrow at city council. Um, do you know what time you're on? Elena? It's currently scheduled at 950 um, for the council meeting, but really depends on what time they get there, but uh, currently scheduled 950. 950. Okay. Yes. So you might be in your jammies by the time it comes, but um, you can hear that. Okay. Um, so that will be in there. Um, did staff have any announcements? Um, other than that particular one, no. Okay. Um, I My announcement is, is uh, really strictly, I see you put something on the agenda about it. Um, so I just would like to show everybody this notebook and some of you may recognize this notebook. Do you, do you recognize if you've ever been to a meeting with me, you've seen this colorful notebook that I've used. I started to use this notebook in 2015 when I joined um, the commission. And this is a very hefty notebook. It has a lot of pages in it. And I'm almost at the end of the notebook. So I think that was somewhat symbolic of the fact that um, my term would be expiring actually um, this spring, summer, right, the June, July, whenever they do the rotation uh, off. But I think I've always had a little bit of commission envy uh, because as we have um, really dug in and tonight we'll discuss it tomorrow more on some development projects. I've always thought, God, the planning commission, you know, those guys really get to do good stuff. And so um, I had put my name in the hat uh, for the planning commission. I know how long these things um, can take. So I had no cl clue necessarily when they would have an opening or when things would be there, but I did it, gosh, ages some, some while ago. And I'm very honored um, to um, now officially been appointed. I am the newbie, the alternate uh, member uh, of the planning commission. And I'll be starting that uh, in January. So um, really not a good idea for someone to be on two commissions uh, at the same time. So tonight is indeed my last um, night as um, uh, FBC. It's been a long time. Ray and I have been shoulder to shoulder through many different iterations, but I have enjoyed meeting all of you, working with all of you. It's been awesome. I've learned a ton um, from everybody and from the staff. Um, it's, it's, it's been phenomenal and I'm hoping to use that knowledge uh, to at least make some small contribution uh, on um, the planning commission. So. I uh, wanted to let people know that you're being put into the very capable hands of our vice chair, Donna Neville. Um, and uh, you will probably next time, I'm not gonna say, but in January probably um, elect an interim vice chair, just so you can get yourselves through to when official elections will be, which this should be in July. Um, so um, I'm 
thrilled about all that. I will ask everybody to go back and look at their contacts because we now have an opening on FBC and um, you should encourage and get some other strong people in. Uh, I like the fact that we're a pretty diverse uh, group and I think we should encourage um, that kind of thing there. Um, let's get some other folks that have different experience uh, set, um, maybe, you know, different age, different gender, different ethnic, whatever we want is, is a definition of diversity, but let's, um, let's go in and do that and, and encourage some more people because I think this is a great commission uh, to be on, particularly great um, foundation for anybody who wants to go do eat some more um, with the city. Okay, so that's my little uh, pitch there. Um, anybody else in terms of brief announcements or liaisons or I'd, I'd love to speak up, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. So first, uh, you just beat me to the punch. Uh, and uh, I was so pleased to have the, the great honor to recommend your appointment to the full city council, which was approved on a 5-0 vote. You've worked so hard for this commission. Uh, your, your even approach to everything right? and your your bottom liner approach to everything to keep things moving along has been a great benefit to the city and you have been so thoughtful. Um, and so you are to be congratulated. I am absolutely certain you will do a terrific job on the planning commission where adding in your, your fiscal orientation into the mix on the decisions that for that group, I think will be a great positive thing. And if you ever miss your old friends, um, we can arrange for another joint workshop between planning and FPC. I'm sure we All can figure right. out a subject to do that if that's if, if Only, that's necessary. Um, when we get to be in person, so we can have snacks. <laughs> so, that would be better for all yeah, of us. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Definitely. Thank anyway, you. you're going to do great, and congratulations. Thank you. And I would right. second second what uh, Dan said. We've had a great chairman. Uh, chairperson, excuse me, uh, Michelle, and I've worked closely with you on several projects and helping to plan, but uh, you're decisive, you're open to suggestions, but decisive, perfect combination, <laughs> not to mention just a fine personality and great person. And Thank you. I also want to remind everybody that this was a uh, David Nat will in January become a full-fledged member and uh, the council, as I understand the rules, and the council will be selecting an alternate to replace him. That is replace true. You, That's right. But to That's replace you. Right. That's so, true. David replaces David, me. You get to know? vote every time. <laughs> and you will become a full regular member. That's correct. That is correct. That's excellent. All right. Well, I appreciate all that. I don't want everybody to feel like I'm saying something because you know I hate making us late worse than anything. So we'll just keep moving um, and we'll go to any public comment. For those that are on the phone, please press star nine. Um, if you are in a Zoom meeting, please do raise hand if you have anything to speak on that's not on the agenda. And I see no one. Excellent, okay. Um, let's move on to the consent calendar. And I believe for this, it is our excellent meeting minutes from the last meeting, which had the hand of Neville. Was that like, what was it in Game of Thrones? The hand of the king um, uh, throughout them. Any uh, corrections to the meeting minutes or comments on the meeting minutes from November 9th? I have one. I have a comment. Um, Go ahead, David. Very quickly, it doesn't look like Michelle as was included as a voting member. That's correct, and it is accurate. Time. It is accurate. That's accurate? You didn't vote for SOS? Well, <laughs> poor Donna was quite torn about this because she went back, she actually did these minutes and went back to, to she was um, working with Elena and Kieran to show them, you know, a good example of what minutes would be. And she went back and listened many times and it turns out that I don't technically say Weiss, yes. And so technically, although I sort of feel like I nod and such, I have not voted. And it turns out that's a very common thing in Zoom that people are doing. So 
thank you for noting that. I feel quite chagrined about the whole thing. Um, and I am very now determined to be very clear that I have voted, but thank you, David, for noting, because I thought I sort of had, but she's right. I She went back and listened and I didn't call my own name. And, and we checked too, just so you know, because we wanted very much to be able, we knew you intended to vote. So we checked with the city clerk and we talked with others. And once the meeting was adjourned, we couldn't really reflect you as having voted. And it wasn't consequential, but so there yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't realize there was so much uh, um, to that comment, but it sounds good. Um, <laughs> Well, the, the other correction, and again, this is minor, but I was at the meeting and has says I wasn't present at the beginning. I switched computers, so I probably got lost in translation, but I was there the entire time. Oh, okay. That's good to know because we couldn't find when you had entered, so we can correct that for sure. We can just vote on them with your yeah. you indicating you were there the whole time. Yeah, why don't you just make that one correction? Member's not present. Just put, just can Mr. Sub was not present, just the Ray, and then you know exactly when Ray entered and just get rid of the David one. Okay. All right, we got that. I'm sorry, Ray had a correction. Yeah, the uh, abstention has a T in it, uh, two T's in it actually, and it's spelled abstention. Which item do, was that? Under the meeting, the acceptance of the minutes of the November 9 special meeting where I was, I abstained. Oh, okay. And it says abstention, and that's not a word. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, yeah, I, didn't I am so firing Donna. I mean, really. Anything else, Ray? No. Okay. Did I hear another person with um, everybody? Did, did anyone else have a comment? I don't see anybody raising hands, so I'm looking for. Okay. I move approval with the uh, with the changes noted. All second. second. Okay, now I'm going to call for the vote again. Weiss says aye. <laughs> Donna. Aye. And uh, Ezra. Beeman says aye. There we go. Busby. Busby aye. Jacob. Aye. Solomon. Solomon aye. Sufi. Aye. Okay, that passes. Thank you guys very much. All right. Now um, we're going to move to the first um, regular item, and I know we've got Kevin Vest. Um, folks, on yes. did you, Elena, want to introduce them? Of course. So um, we have talked about um, speaking about OPEB and pension and doing a presentation. So um, as we closing up the fiscal year 1920, we've had um, updated reports from Governor Best on particular our OPEB plan. Um, and uh, one of the things we thought would be good is to be able to provide you with an update um, of where we are. We do have two speakers uh, today, Max Stop, uh, representing Devon Best, as well as um, Nina, but um, I think I'm going <laughs> to mispronounce your name, so I do apologize, but Tuleji? That's correct. Like, okay. That's correct. That's great. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very oh, much. So, um, Nina is the um, actuary uh, for uh, working with Gump Invest and um, they will go over um, and do a presentation um, for us. And at the end, you will get a chance to ask questions. So um, Nina and Max, you may take off and let me know when you need me to switch the slides and I will do that. Okay, thanks, Elena. Yeah, I was wondering if I needed to run the PowerPoint, but you've got it right there. So again, I'm Nina Pelleggi. I'm an, I'm an actuary with uh, GovInvest and Max Stoff is our customer service, our client success manager. So um, we're going to look at both your retirement plans, uh, your pension plans and your OPEB plans. So our agenda, the OPEB valuation reports, we're gonna look where you are now, we'll look back and we'll look at some graphs with some projected liabilities and costs. And we'll do the same thing with the pension valuation reports. And then we'll do a very short educational slide about how you get an unfunded accrued liability or a UAL, how those evolve at the end. And then feel free to interrupt with any questions at any time. All right, so Elena, thank you. So OPEV 
is a mouthful and it stands for other post-employment benefits. Other meaning not retirement. For the city of Davis, your other post-employment benefits consist of the retiree health or medical benefits. So when people retire from the city of Davis, um, they get a, a subsidy towards medical premiums. And um, those need to be valued in a, an evaluation report by an actuary. Um, so this doesn't include pensions or severance pay. So where are we now? You had a recent uh, report dated June 30th, 2020. Um, that was the report date, but the measurement date, meaning the date that the census was provided, the asset value was provided, et cetera, the assumptions were set was June 30, 2019. So you had an unfunded actuarial liability of 57 million or so. You're funded at around 41%. And then there's something called the actuarially determined contribution. We like to say ADC, it's much easier. For your fiscal year 1920 was 7.3 million. And that consists of two pieces of a, a normal cost, which is the cost of the benefits being earned in that year, plus an unfunded, a payment to that unfunded liability and amortization payment. Um, and that was about 20.7% of payroll. Now, um, well, let's look back and then we'll note a few things. So we're we'll comparing the most recent report to the previous report so we can see some changes. Um, the unfunded liability did go down. Um, money was put in, that's the main reason. The funded percentage went up. The ADC grew by 15%. Um, and, and it went up also as the percent of payroll I believe he switched actuaries between those two reports and uh, the new actuary could have uh, been uh, changing some assumptions up or just count rate kind of changed. And your payroll, covered payroll went up about 7%. So- um, most Can you important, not make, yes. Sorry, I would like to add something real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Just in case to potentially, you know, anticipate a question, um, we did not make in right. fiscal year 1920, um, an actual contribution above what we were required to on a pay goal basis. So, and I know Nina mentioned, yes, we have. And part of the reason is because when this particular evaluation was done, it was done on a look back uh, basis a year ago. So that payment did happen. So when we do next, evaluation next year, that's when the no payment will be reflected. I just want to make sure because we did make a big deal out of it to preserve cash as part of a budget, we did not make that payment. So I just wanted to be clear um, that this reflects a little bit um, different the year just because of the look back. Right, was, but about two and a half million, I can't remember, was that the amount? Um, we actually estimated it to be at about a $1.7 million okay. savings to just the general fund itself. And it, it actually ended up being a greater amount for the general fund. Okay. Maybe you could clarify, going forward, is the assumption going to be that we, we will resume those additional payments? Um, what we projected in the budget, if you recall, that there will be two years uh, anticipated not to make the payment and only leave it at payable amount. So that would be 1920, actual 1920 year and 2021. After that, the expectation is the city will continue doing um, the full amount. Go ahead, Nina. I'm sorry. Okay, let's, that's okay. Let's go to the next slide. So I, yeah, because the next slide, well, it's actually a slide. But, this is a projected liability. So projected liability, the, the, the light blue area is your, um, the light blue area is the valuation assets growing. And uh, the red area is what we call the unfunded actuarial liability or accrued liability. And then the blue line on top is the sum of those two and it's the actuarial liability. So this is a projection over time as if you made that ADC every year, um, instead of uh, skipping the couple of years of pay go. So the next slide actually is the, shows what uh, Elena just talked about. So yes, we took a, a, a break from contributing the ADC and went with the pay go. In other words, just the retiree benefits as they came due. 
And what that does is delays, um, it, it, it increases the unfunded because you're not contributing on the benefits being earned nor paying off your, your unfunded liability with the amortization payment. So this graph is just shows how that couple year delay um, in um, paying the ADC affects your unfunded. Now your actuary has assumed about a 20 year amortization payment. And what Elena said um, is that after the two year contribution holiday, it's sometimes called, um, that you're, you'll probably push out that amortization that additional two years. And that can be discussed with um, the actuary at the time when, it, when you resume making the payments. And that would push this, this graph out a, a little bit, the, the top blue line out another couple of years if that's what you choose to do. Are there any questions about the, the OPEV? So that, that's the end of the OPEV. We wish it was just OPEV. Now we get to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so pension overview, you get your pensions, your retirement benefits through the CalPERS system. And you have two groups. You have a miscellaneous classic benefits. Those are for people hired before January of 2013. And the formula, as it's known in CalPERS, is 2.5% of final pay at age 55. And employees that the, the required contribution is 8%. Our understanding is that there's uh, an additional amount that the classic employees pay. And Elena, do you know that? or? Um, actually, we clarified with our um, uh, human resources, and in 1920 specifically, there was no cost share. Um, oh, okay. The cost came into play in, uh, in this current year for the first time. Oh, okay. All right. So employees are going to begin to cost share, it sounds like. Great. And then uh, we have the miscellaneous PEPRA benefits employees hired after 2013, and they have a 2% at 62. So they have to wait additional years to get their full benefit. And then the, the multiplier is smaller and they have to contribute 50% of normal cost. Okay, so then when the, then, whoops, <laughs> that, that's okay. Then there's the safety benefits. And again, there's a split between pre 2013 and after um, with the same sort of idea that the benefits after 2013 are just, uh, they're a little bit less and a little bit later. And the, again, we have the 9% of pay for the, are, are they also delayed in their um, additional cost sharing? Um, no, the safety employees started their cost sharing and had 3% uh, okay. in 1920. Yeah. And then the PEPRA, they contribute about 30% of pay, which is half of the normal cost rate. All right. So where are we now? This is based on the 2019 reports that came out in, uh, it was late August, early September, I can't remember for sure. So we've split it out by miscellaneous and safety. You have unfunded liabilities for both groups, um, 84 million for miscellaneous, 59 million for safety. Funded percentages is roughly the same, 60, almost 64 for miscellaneous, almost 65 for safety. Um, required contribution, we have 9.3 and 6.7 respectively. And then uh, the retire required contribution, which like the OPEV I mentioned is the normal cost plus amortization of, in this case, many bases. We have 46.6% for miscellaneous and 59.2 for safety. And um, CalPERS has their amortization policy where depending on what made you get an amortization base, um, then, then different rules are applied for the length and the um, methodology of the amortization. All right, so comparing that to the previous reports. So even though I said the reports were in uh, 63019, we're comparing it to the 63018 reports. Those reports predict, or not predict, um, calculate the contribution rates two years down the road. So that's why you see the 2020 to 2021 and the 2021 to 2022. So the required contribution miscellaneous has gone up 9.3 million versus 8.2. And as a percent of payroll has gone up and your cover payroll has gone up as well. And the unfunded liability has increased 6.6% and the funding percentage has 
gone down. And that's due to um, some delay that there's what's called ramp ups in the amortization uh, period. And um, those uh, delay the amortization and increase the unfunded. So let's look at the safety slide. Um, Nina, would you have um, a question from Commissioner Jacobs? Uh, would you like to ask it now or later? I could wait or now. Well, I just, my only question about this, and I think it's explained by the time lags, but I looked up CalPERS uh, funded and unfunded liability. And CalPERS on its site says they are now, thanks to a good stock market, I think largely up to about 71% funded. Mm -hmm. And I see that we are uh, in safety at closer to 65 mm -hmm. and miscellaneous 64. Is that because of the timing of these? Uh, the yeah, these, the market? yeah this, so this is, this is a snapshot of over a year ago. And Calper, so and every every agency has their own funded percentage. So that's the other thing um, because agencies can and do put in additional contributions um, that that get them closer to 100% funded. So it's it's a function of your funding history, uh, what plans you're in, what formulas you've offered, and so on that um, determines your your funded percentage. But it, there's a chance we might be a little better off than these. Yeah. Show. Well, yeah, there was, you know, for 630 2020, the asset return, um, CalPERS asset return was 4.7%. So they didn't make the 7%. Mm -hmm. And now they've made up some of that. Um, I think they probably are a little bit ahead. Um, so these, these are absolutely snapshots in time one day, you know, the actuaries measure it on one day, and it can definitely change, and does change over time. So yeah, you might be a little better off with a even though the 4.7% was returned for the year end 630 2020, as you all know, the market has done quite well in the last several months. So yeah, it's possible that um, things are a little better now. And I also want to add that um, because this measurement of how well they've done in the market happens as of June 30th, we actually need the, mar the market to continue doing well until that time, you know, that's correct. actually so, um, so do I. recognize it. <laughs> we all, we would all like that. Um, yeah. So the next snapshot will be six. Well, they're already working on the 630, 2020 valuations, but yeah, what you, to they'll measure 630, 2021, and hopefully they'll have, maybe it'll be better than 7% and you'll have an asset gain that will offset previous asset losses. Um, and one more um, item to add, uh, Paul, is if CalPERS earns at least 7% or does better than 7% in this fiscal year at the time of June 30th, um, we won't actually see that um, gain reflected in our rates for, I believe it's two years, because that's what their lag time is. So. Mm -hmm. If we do it in 22, we won't actually know, I'm sorry, uh, 21, we won't see it in until 23 rates, I believe, so. Yes, there is a two year lag between validates and effective dates of contribution rates. Yep. Great, okay, safety, similar look here where the required contribution has gone up as both a dollar amount and a percent of payroll. Again, some of those amortization bases are kicking in. Cover payroll has gone up about the same amount, 4.6%. And unfunded liability has gone up and the funded percentage has gone down very slightly. So here's similar graph to OPEV. And so again, the light blue on the bottom is the assets. The red area is unfunded liability. The darker blue line on top is the crude liability and they, they merge after a certain point because CalPERS um, funding policy, their amortization policy is just to drive you to towards 100% funded over a period of years. And the new funding policy is a period of 20 years. So any, any new basis set up after this, including the 63019 valuations are um, at the most 20 years long. And we could see on the next slide. So this is, this is where you could see those ramp up effects of the, the curve going up there on the left. And then it plateaus more or less for a number of years 
And then the, uh, some of your bases have a ramp down or some of the bases are falling off at the end there. And then you end up with only the orange bit, which is the normal cost. So the purple on the bottom is the unfunded payments. I'd like to also add, this is a snapshot in time, just like Nina said, um, we need CalPERS to actually continue performing well, or at least at the rate, discount rate, earn discount rate that they projected mm -hmm. in order for it to actually play out this way. Um, if it changes, the benefit changes, demographics changes, this graph will obviously be affected as well. All right. Thank you, Elena, absolutely. It's a snapshot. This is our software, the government software that does these predictions. Um, we do have uh, a lot of agencies looking at different scenarios, which we can model for you in our software of different asset returns or different discount rates. CalPERS continuously does evaluate both demographic assumptions and economic assumptions. So how did you get an, an unfunded accrued liability? Well, Discount rate has gone down. It was seven and a half percent just a few years ago. Now it's at seven. So if the discount rate goes down, the UAL goes up. So investment returns, if uh, an, a geometric return of 7% hasn't been earned over time, and of course it was seven and a half percent earlier, um, then, you, then you get a UAL. So if your investment returns are lower than assumed. Um, if you put in, a, what's called additional discretionary payments, ADPs, either by the employer making it or your, your employee contributions, not just offsetting the employer amount, but directed towards the UAL, then the UAL gets paid down. Your workforce goes up, um, can and create more UAL. Uh, salary changes, if your salary change, you know, CalPERS does assume they have economic assumptions and that includes that salaries go up, you know, as pe new people are hired, that they get step raises and so on. And, and then longer term employees are assumed to get, you know, very flat inflation and raises. But if you outpace the CalPERS assumptions and uh, you might make a, a UAL there. And then mortality rates, um, if they go up, and then the UAL can there we go. You have a mortality, what's called a mortality gain. Um, yeah, it will be interesting. Uh, the COVID, I'm actually to, not tomorrow, Wednesday, I'm I'm listening to a Society of Actuaries webinar on COVID, COVID's effects on pension plans. So that'll be an interesting presentation. I, I hate to, I'm glad you went there because that's immediately what I was thinking. And it's like, I, that would be very interesting. Yeah, it, it will be interesting. And yeah, and Social Security too. It'll be very interesting uh, to see, unfortunately, in the mortality gains, uh, how much that will offset the uh, payroll tax, you know, losses. I to guess this is back to the, the old silver lining behind every right. cloud, I guess. So um, that's the end of our presentation. And I'm Max and I are available for questions. And I awesome. see Donna has uh, her hand raised, so. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate it. I had two questions and I just was wondering um, what, on the slide where you said pension, where are we now? And you show our funded percentages. Mm -hmm. there, I'm just curious if you have a sense, yeah, on that one, if you have a sense of where the city of Davis is relative to other similar California mm -hmm. cities in terms of our funded percentage, where do we rank roughly? I'm gonna let Max answer that one. Max, he he speaks to so many agencies all over the state. I you know I do too, but he by far has uh, you know talked to far more agencies. Max, do you have a good answer for that? Sure, um, I can speak in gener generalities. So um, the average for miscellaneous is usually in the low 70s. Um, safety is slightly lower than that. Um, but that is going to kind of vary agency to agency, region to region. Uh, typically, we see plans with a lower funded ratio on the safety side of things than the miscellaneous mm -hmm. side of things. Yeah, this so is unusual. In that yeah. case, Davis is an exception. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you. And I had one other question. It's a little bit of a slightly complex question, but I'll throw it out there. Um, one of the, the recommendations that one of our commission subcommittees has been trying to get our arms around and analyzed has to do with um, whether it makes sense to recommend that uh, certain um, 
reserve funds we have in two restricted, two different restricted funds where we have an excess reserve, whether there's any merit to using some of that excess to pay down either the OPEB or pension liability and associated of course, only with the employees who are funded through that fund because that's the only way that can be done legally. And our understanding is it can be done, but CalPERS can't track it the way we would need for them to track it for us to demonstrate we've made those payments for those mm -hmm. subclasses of employees and that we'd have to do some actuarial analysis of our own to demonstrate that we were making the appropriate payments. So I'm just curious if in the work that you do across the state, you've ever seen other clients who have done that sort of thing where they have taken money that is restricted and been able to sort of apply it just to the OPEB and pension attributable or that's associated with certain employees, class, subclasses of employees. Is that ever done? Well, we kind of have some of this coming up right now, right, Max? We're looking into this for, for some counties where they have the judicial employees, right? Um, yeah, it happens a lot yeah. at the county level yeah. when yeah. they're folks that are funded through either state or federal um, revenue streams. Um, I would say where we kind of fit into all of this is frequently we get requests to break out liabilities and simulate payments for specific groups. Um, that's something we could work with city staff on and work to model out. That's usually kind of, it is a request we get. Sometimes it intersects more with labor negotiations, but it does come up from time to time. Okay, thank you. Right. And you're right that CalPERS, they, you know, they're not going to say this, this money is for, what, I'm just going to make a management, you know, they're not going to, they're going to say this money is for the city of Davis and um, they don't, definitely do not track it that way. Um, but yeah, we could do, we could give you some liabilities and costs for specific groups. Thank you. Um, well, okay. Since their hand up, I can't see. <laughs> um, we have um, Ezra and then also Ray. So how about okay. we go order? Ezra, you Great. first and then Ray. Let's see if this works. Um, hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so a couple of questions. I just want to confirm a few things just to make sure I'm not misunderstanding. Um, I think you just said that, and I can't remember if it was for OPEB or pensions, that the, the, the average was about 75% uh, funded? For was that pension? Was that for pension, okay. And we're at sort of 60, 65. So we're not too far behind there. Well, we're below average, but not mm -hmm. too far behind, not like OPEB. And you, do you have any facts at hand uh, with respect to the OPEB typical um, funding level? Yeah, so OPEB, you're, you know, there's a lot of agencies who are not funding at all. They're, pre, they're not pre-funding. They're just doing pay go completely. They have no assets set aside in a trust. So okay. that you have that you're 40, per, I think it was 41% funded. Actually, you're probably above the average age, age, agency for sure on the OPEB. That, that's good to hear. Cause I was looking at the pensions and it, it looks like, I mean, we finally pay ourselves off in sort of 2040. So yeah. it's a long, it's it's a long so haul long. and we're still facing pretty high um, increases. Now this question is actually more for Elena. Um, I'm pretty sure that what we're seeing here is already sort of included in the Leland model. I mean, for the most part. So nothing we've seen today really shifts that very much either way, other than, you know, CalPERS has performed really well. Maybe COVID will reduce our long-term liabilities, but we haven't really, I guess what I'm reaching for is, is, is there a big delta since the last time we looked at this that we should be cognizant of? Um, well, there, as we're going to move into obviously a new budget cycle, that's one of the things we're going to evaluate, but you are correct. Uh, when we do project long-term um, in our long-term model, um, we do include pensions. And as a matter of fact, for um, conservative purposes, we're also assuming that eventually uh, CalPERS is going to lower their discount rate. Again, their target, at least what they would like to have, uh, that they've spoken about was six and a half percent. So mm -hmm. we do build in into our model a reduction um, down to that percentage over a significant long term time. Um, but we do take that into consideration. 
So in that sense, yes, you're correct. This is not a surprise. Uh, we expect these to go, um, the, the contributions from CalPERS, required contributions to go up. Um, the question is going to be, how do we want to deal with that? But again, we have lots of priorities that council gets to decide on um, as we move through the budget process. Right now in the Leland model, we currently have this sort of a payoff, I'm pretty sure. Okay. It's built in, yes. Thanks. That's it for me. Um, Array? So how many people in the pension pool and the OPEB pool roughly? Um, I could look it up. I could pull up your reports, uh, Elena. Yeah, if you could you just, know? if somebody could just send that to me. And then the other was talking to another actuary last week, looking at mortality, sadly. It seems to be skewed, you uh, know, in increasing percentage the older the uh, person is. So, and, and this was the person who does the uh, actuarial calculations for the Ford Motor Companies and their treasury group. Mm -hmm. No significant effect because mortality of those 55 and older is about a quarter percent to date. Mm -hmm. Even if it, doubles or triples, we're looking at less than 1%. Does that uh, coincide with what you're hearing from industry sources, Nina? Um, I, I would say that's, that's about right. And you know what will happen for CalPERS is they have a large enough, what we, what we call a credible amount of people to do their own mortality study. And, and they do do that. And um, so only time will tell. Uh, you know, if, if there's, there might be a small gain from that for one year, but um, actuaries, if, if the vaccines are effective, are probably not going to change their mortality projections. So what actuaries do right now is they assume, we assume that mortality rates are going to improve. In other words, because of technology, because of advances in medical research and treatments, we assume that mortality is going to improve over the next 50 to 100 years. I mean, that's how long it'll take to pay out everyone you, you currently have on staff. And the COVID, if the vaccines especially are effective, probably will just be a small blip and maybe a gain this year, next year, very small mortality gain. And then um, the mortality will continue to improve again. So uh, yeah, that's my answer. Um, in the quick response, Ray, just so you know, for our miscellaneous plan, um, we have, as of 2019 measurement date, 258 active members. We have uh, 436 retirees. Um, and there are some members that have been considered transferred or terminated as well, but, um, but in total, 436 um, retirees and 258 actives. And for Police safety plan, again, classic members, I'm not taking into account Pepper right now, but 36 actives, um, 104 retired. We have about 49 that are transferred or separated. So not necessarily retired from our plan. Um, and for fire safety, again, classic, 32 actives and 14 transferred or separated and 67 retired. Can I ask a, uh, just a question? I know we're running out of time here. So, uh, and Nina, this might be unfair, but this, I, I just would like the big animal picture on this one. And it was good that uh, Elena just gave us the numbers because we can see how many more people we have that are already retired. But I do want to ask about current labor uh, and current employees. Are there things, again, big animal picture that cities can do in terms of their negotiations with labor to help reduce some of this? We talked about the percent contribution, that kind of thing. Can you just sketch for us just some things that people have done in order to kind of go after this big mountain that they have? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, and you want me to focus on labor or other strategies? No, I'm sorry. All, all personnel. I shouldn't have used the word labor, just personnel. Oh, personnel. Kind of oriented. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, it's mostly negotiate negotiated because of the benefits you can't really change. Um, negotiating uh, additional contributions 
uh, to be made uh, by your classic employees. So the Pepper employees okay. are making- Pepper, They're already, already doing some, yeah. Yeah, they're already doing something. So, okay. um, and Max, do you have any anything to offer on the labor? You know, we, we I, I'm more on the, uh, like starting a 115 trust or doing a fresh start on your amortization or seeing- No, no, go, like, you can go to that too, before you leave. I was gonna say, I didn't wanna <laughs> leave that out there. Unless Max, do you have anything more to add on the- so no. For the personnel side, the only thing we do see frequently is if, say, a trust is established, um, creating some kind of like matching contribution program between uh, employees and the city. City, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, on the OPEP yeah. side, and the OPEP side, you have a lot more freedom there to reduce benefits, to to um, ask for more cost sharing. Etc. Or put in a, a, a vesting schedule, or you know, there's all OPEV. It's really you can do what you want to do on future hires and uh, so on. But the pension, it's much harder. So, but on the strat, we have a whole um, we have a, a pension funding policy template, also mm -hmm. OPEV funding policy template that looks through all these ideas of setting up a 115 trust. Do you all know what that is? Um, I believe that's the case because we already have a 115 trust um, for with OPEB. helpers for OPEB. Oh, right. um, so similar, you know, uh, arrangement for, for pensions. But for pension, right. And um, so these, these templates we have takes you through all sort of uh, what other agents, you know, other ideas agencies have done, like the 115 trust or that's used to sort of uh, to save and then earn a higher interest rate that you can earn in general funds or um, or making additional discretionary payments or um, or making payments that stabilize contribution rates. You know, uh, Max and I take clients to the agencies through these yeah. all the time. Um, Thanks. Help you strategize. Thanks. I just want to make sure I don't have any more commissioner questions. We do need to go to public comment. Yeah. So we have Edgar Kern, um, who has his hand up. Awesome. Please. Thank you so much, Nina, for your presentation. Quick question. Do the projections that GovInvest creates, um, what assumption do they have for new retirees? Um, so that rate of growth. Oh, new retirees or new... <laughs> Well, yeah. so we use the, the CalPERS um, underlying retirement assumptions. And then we're, we we're, our projections are what we call the, an open group basis. Mm -hmm. And that means as we, we assume that the active count stays steady. So as people are decrement or, you know, the, the, the system projects that someone is retired, they're going to be replaced with a PEPRA employee and keeping okay. the count steady. So that's, that's what we, we assume. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, you had another question? Did you call on me? Yes. Did you have a, <clears throat> do you have an estimate of how many of our employees, our safety employees are now covered by PEPRA? Um, we actually yeah. should be able to provide that information mm -hmm. based on the actuarial reports that are provided. So mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind me sending them out, maybe at a later, um, not right now, I'll, I can do that. Yeah, in the past, we were told, I think that uh, at first, there were only about 10%, uh, a couple of years ago, only about 10% mm -hmm. recovered by the new. But that obviously is going to keep increasing. It's going to keep increasing, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, the software assumes that as people leave, they're replaced with that Pepper employee. Which isn't always true, right? If it isn't always true. Out. Right now, that's, that's the, you know, we have a new version of the software coming out in late January, and it's going to be more, uh, more robust and allow for, for, uh, very interesting modeling opportunity. So we're really excited about that, including looking at that Pepper versus Classic split. So right. great. Um, we, are we set to go to public comment? Anybody else? Let's. Okay. All right. And do we have a public comment? So if you're on the phone, please press star nine. If you are on Zoom, please do raise hand. And I do not see anybody, Michelle. Okay, excellent. Well, I wanna thank both of you, Nina and Max, um, so much. That was an excellent presentation. I know we've been waiting a while for Gavin Best to come in, um, but that was good. It was 
one case where I think you did a nice job between just going through what your slides did, but explaining them more and taking questions. That's good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you was, so much. Thank you. It was you. lovely to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Enjoy All the right. rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Max. Okay. We already um, yes. want to move on. If... Sorry, Elena, is there? Yes. Um, we're ready to move on. Um, yeah, uh, item 6B, yeah. And um, Ezra, we have only allocated 15 minutes for this one. So I'm going to ask you to maybe kind of pull us through this. Uh, you know, we've got your proposal and, and see what you want because I mean this this could literally we could we could spend probably 10 hours on arguing all the, the points so um let me have you go ahead and present what you wanted to say okay. um <clears throat> so i assume everybody's read it uh and uh, through questions we'll figure out you know what i should really uh, what questions i should really answer the only sort of overarching thing I would say about it is this arose out of the work that the committee was doing on the um, uh, the MRC, whatever, what do we call it these days? The MRC. And RIC, actually, but who's oh, to, yeah. Pardon that. <laughs> um, but it, in, in going through that project in some detail, uh, there was a list of uh, issues that we had identified at the time. <clears throat> and this paper is not saying that any of those issues are true. This paper is saying that these are a number of issues that when you do some high level analysis, they give us some um, orders of magnitude. And all we're, we're really trying to do here is say, look, this is um, a framework that we're proposing to move forward on in terms of analyzing these issues that, that we as a team had originally identified. Um, and let us know if there are any other issues you think we've missed um, or that anything else that you want us to factor in. This is really a dry run. The idea being that we will take on board all of this feedback, including from our uh, council reps, um, and we will uh, reflect it in a revised paper to come back um, ideally in the, at the next meeting. Uh, and that would also include um, spreadsheets, uh, et cetera, so you can look at it yourself. Uh, but really this was just saying, look, hey, we're, we're, we're planning on doing this. What do you think? Um, give us your input so that next time when we come back, uh, we will have uh, taken that on board. Basically, that's it. Okay. So, unfortunately, I cannot, for some reason, see who has a hand up. Um, I'm going to just put some people on the spot. So I'm not because Gerkern and Doug were on the committee. Paul, do you have some comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I I see several issues here. One that I think is thing that you've pointed out that is very good is that we, I, I'm not sure when the last time the city looked at, evaluated its impact fee structure for new development. And as you point out, I think this is correct that it was frozen at a certain level going back a few years and that it could make a difference in looking at future developments uh, as we should. I think there's some problems with this way of analyzing things. For one thing, you're assuming that we're uh, depreciating, we, that newcomers are gonna pick up legacy costs. I'm not sure why a newcomer, new development, new property owners should pick up development costs. Uh, legacy costs that the city has accrued over time. And, and in fact, they're going to pay them anyway, because I don't know why they, what I'm saying is they shouldn't be penalized additionally, because uh, they are paying additional taxes over, I bought my house several years ago, I'm not paying the taxes that someone would buy a comparable house today. They're, they're paying more in taxes than I am, but it doesn't make sense to me to include anything about pensions or OPED in, in, in terms of legacy costs. Also, there are several references here to the Leland model. Uh, I think that what you're referring to should, uh, the Leland model uses numbers generated by the city for, from a variety of sources, but I think you're talking about 
what we used to call the city's impact fee, impact model. Uh, I've forgotten the exact terminology, but it was what, when we don't have an outside consultant come in, we have a model that uh, looks at uh, what the long-term costs and benefits to the city are. I also think it's an error to assume that one-time fees don't help over a longer period of time in terms of infrastructure. I think uh, if a new, if obviously MRIC, MRIC as it's properly known or DISC or whatever it's called is gonna have impact is it would have had a substantial number uh, amount of impact fees uh, would have generated a, a substantial amount. And those would have been used in a whole variety of ways that don't just affect that development, but have implications. They could be used to improve an interchange on the freeway nearby. It could be a portion of it could be used on roads more generally in the city because these new, uh, the impact would be more general in the city. So I think there's some errors in thought here, but uh, uh, we can argue about those for a long time, I suppose. But okay. the other thing, one, just one more comment. It strikes me that a draft of this uh, should be run by the city staff and see how they respond before bringing it back to the commission. As a journalist, before I wrote a story, I tried to check with people, knowledgeable people within, say, if I was covering City Hall, within City Hall, to see if my figures made sense and so on. It would be interesting to see what that response is before we follow up. And one last point, total potential costs over 10 years, uh, 12.7 million. Well, I think some of that we can argue about whether that's true, but uh, when you look at a development, uh, some of these developments are putting uh, much more than that into the city. And I think even if these figures are absolutely correct, uh, re if we build in replacement capital expenditures, for example, uh, even if we did that, which I don't think the city does except on the utilities in the covered by the enterprise funds, I, I think even then it might turn out that uh, a substantial development like DISC which did fail at the ballot box, admittedly, uh, could still be a net benefit to the city. Anyway, end of my comments. Oh, great, good feedback. Um, let me go to Ray uh, next and then Don, I'll go to you. Uh, I have a number of comments rather than take time out of our busy agenda. Do I send the comments to Pam respecting the Brown, Brown Act Pam Day? or who should I send them to for distribution to the subcommittee? Um, well, it would be Pam for sure, because she's leaving okay. us. Um, uh, Donna, if he, let's hold it for now. I'm gonna come back on process, okay? Let's just hold that. Donna, you can think about that for just a minute, but because I, I think there's a process question in general here, but let's think about it. So you have some specific things you'd like to, yeah, it's, uh, a yeah. number of things, including those that were in my June 2nd analysis of DISC, you know, things like property tax splits, et cetera. But rather than trip through those now verbally, because I haven't submitted anything for people to see, I think it'd be easier okay. if I just wrote my comments back to the subcommittee. And I, and I thank them for what I think is an excellent start on the process. Yeah, we, we do. Okay, so I, I will come back on the process question and how we have to do it. Um, Donna, do you have just some comments on the um, memo itself and, and all? Yeah, I'll, and first of all, Ezra, thank you. And to your subcommittee, I mean, having a work product in front of us is so helpful. I guess what I was going to suggest too is because we don't have a lot of time, if we just focus on specific sort of requests of Ezra for next go round. And I would really echo what Paul said as well, because as I read each of your categories, I wanted to know what the city's perspective was on that point, because I, I think I might know it and we may have heard it in prior discussions, but I'd love to see it in one concise place. 
Um, I also have a lot of questions too. I know we don't have time. Um, and I'm not, I don't want to put myself in the position of, of playing the role of city attorney. Um, you know, obviously the, the subcommittee really can't share its deliberations with, you know, the rest of us outside of the meetings, but I'm not sure there's any reason we can't feed a question to them to help, but I, I'm, I'm going to, I would defer. I don't know if Kelly's, Kelly's not on the line or Zoe. I just would rather they answer that question and see what they're comfortable with. Okay, so you'll get back to us. I mean, to me, that was basically raised, which is how do I send them? Here's yeah. a set of thoughts I had, questions, whatever. Okay. Can you build this into your analysis? I mean, if we had time, yeah. preferred practice would be to quickly outline what we want to see now in the public meeting. That would be the preferred practice, but I understand it's a little hard to run through all that now. Well, I think the other issue we have is a lot of what we do is fairly detailed. So yeah. um, it's not like a, oh, A, B, C, blue, green, yellow, and you're done. Yeah. Um, okay. David, did you have some comments you wanted to make? I do not. I'll just send my couple comments by the email. Well, hold, hold because we'll find out if we can do the email. All right. Let me um, make a few comments as well. So yeah, I, I really want to echo that I'm I'm like excited, you know, that, that you guys like are, are actually getting together and doing what I think a subcommittee ought to do, which is you're saying, um, we've been complaining about this model or these things and we don't necessarily agree with it. Let's go after them. Like let's, and, and you wrote it down and you know, thank you Ezra for getting it out. I know it was rushed to do and putting draft on it because it is a draft. It's your guys' thoughts, right? Right now you didn't vet everything and all the, there's some little, things in here that are not exactly right, but you know, you would fix it if it was a formal um, kind of thing. Um, I do think that um, what I'd like to do is from a process step, I think rather than coming up with this whole thing and you know, you, you use an unfortunate verb of directing city staff, which I, I just gonna, I, I don't, we don't, we don't direct, we, you know, we, we, you know, we ask city staff, we request, we, you know, we, we don't tell them what they have to do. Um, we're an advisory, you know, commission, but um, I do think that really the next step is to sit down with an Ash Feeney um, and, and probably, you know, the people in his, on his team that deal with that development model and say, hey, here's some things we see what do you think? Um, specifically, I thought the one on impact fees, um, you know, around the CPI and that, that question, is that true? And is this, is this what we think? And, you know, whatever, let us know. Um, and then I think that's really a, a good next step uh, for this because, you know, they're vested too in making sure this is correct. And if from that, we still have a big disagreement that is consequential, right? It can't be like, oh, we think they should have a nickel in and they think we should have six cents. Okay, forget. But if it's it's consequential, then we we then would generate a report saying this is what we believe and this is why and that sort of thing. But I really think the next step is to get with Ash and team and go through this and have them, you know, you're kicking tires with them. And then Donna, are you saying in terms of people sending some specific some more things that they maybe would want Ezra, Gakern and Doug to discuss that for now, what if they send the email to Elena and then we find out, Elena and we finds out from Kelly, et cetera, what the appropriate way to do things. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't want to give legal advice on it. So yes, people should just send their questions to Elena and Elena. she can decide how to handle it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, does that seem fair, Ray? Then you would do that. Okay. Um, now let me go to the guys on the, you know, Ezra Dugger Kern, where there are some additional things. And, you know, I'll just say also, you know, I, I, I could go through some of this stuff, like, but the 25%, 75, you know, I, I'm not in the 100% variable camp. Sorry, I'm just not. But let's have it out and, you know, come to it to some sort of agreement. And some have said 50%. <laughs> so for, it, it might vary from department to department how, how you charge. Yeah. Maybe let me say a, a couple of words and then I'll go to my co 
um, yeah. people. Um, so first of all, thank you for the feedback. Uh, really, this is floating a balloon, right? <laughs> what what sort of uh, yeah. things? And that goes for CSF. Like ideally, yep, I would have loved to have consulted, but just getting the thing out at this stage. And I sort of felt like you've seen it for the first time. They'll see it for the first time. We'll get all that feedback and input. And based on that, you'll have what was hopefully the template moving forward, which Michelle and, and Donna, I think, laid out in their memo, which is here's the issue, here's the analysis, here's who we consulted, and here's the recommendation. So I think we're on, on, on track for that. Um, and I know there's going to be lots of views. I mean, what this is, one of the things this is saying to me is <clears throat> we really should focus on the impact fee and replacement analysis because it seems to be a lot bigger. Even if we went to 50%, you can see here that it goes from 1.7 to 3.4. Uh, in terms of a total value over a 20 year period. Um, so, you know, it was really floating the balloons. Here's some of the things the subcommittee had been talking about. We did a quick back of the napkin. This is sort of how it played out. Um, let's just tackle these in order. Let's get the list right. Um, and, and, you know, any other sort of things you wanted to guide us on, on that. So that, yeah. that was really yeah. where we're coming from. So, and I, I like the impact fees. The as well, because we really mostly focused on the net fiscal benefit. We didn't really, the impact fees were sort of there. And then we talked about the 5 million a year. You know, we didn't we didn't touch that big other bucket. Well, and the other thing is lining up things on an equal basis, right? This is a fundamental thing we have to get right. And sometimes we get reported in total upfront costs. Sometimes it's like total cost and build out. So, you know, I put my economics and finance hat out and I came up with a 20 year NPV window and brought it back to present value, but you know maybe that's not the right approach. I feel like the com the commission just has work to do to thrash out how we want to do some of this stuff and then get into the discussion around what we think the right economic or financial or whatever advice is. So anyway, I don't want to hog up all the oxygen now. So let let me turn it over. So a lot of these points definitely came up in our review of DISC and they were kind of a, a starting point for what we would like to, what are, where are opportunities that we can see some, some more evaluation. So definitely there, there might be some contentious points, um, but I think that's, that's kind of why they're here so that we can, we can get down to the, the bottom of them and see, okay, what would be the best for the city? So, uh, totally welcome. And this is, there's also 12, 12 months over which we're collecting um, information supporting each of these points. So after, after 12 months, we'll kind of have a, a, a decent summary of our findings ready. So that's, those are my thoughts. Doug? Yeah, um, there's, again, these are all issues that we've, we've discussed uh, on the subcommittee and, and there's some of these things, there's, you know, I, like Paul pointed out, there's there's still a lot of discussion on, you know, the 25% the variable, 75% um, fixed, or it's the opposite, sorry, 25% um, fixed. So, um, but then on the other hand, there are cer certain things on this list that I think are, we pretty much all agree on. For example, the fact that the impact fees, um, if, if it, you know, there's uh, at the very least, the, there's, there's very little transparency on how the impact fees are calculated. And when you talk to the city staff, you, you, you learn one thing, but that's not written down or published as far as I can tell anywhere. Um, for example, that um, the impact fees are actually based on persons per household which is not the way it's set forth um, or presented on the city website. It's, it, it's presented as a, if everything is done on a per unit basis. So you would think that the you know, five bedroom uh, student apartment with eight people living in it is paying the same impact fee as a studio apartment. My understanding from talking to staff is that's not the case. Point being, I think we all generally agree that that's one area that needs a fair amount of work. Um, and, and indeed, we're, we're starting a general plan process here and that's, that's gonna impact the process. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we feel like we need some level of, uh, a better level of transparency and, um, and some sort of update, some sort of reassurance we can tell our constituents like, hey, this has been updated since 2013 and we're paying uh, you know, we're, we're asking developers to pay fees that are reasonable, mm -hmm. um, even if the general plan isn't yet completed. 
you know? And so, so at any rate, I just, I would just, okay. you know, mm -hmm. highlight that there are, you know, there are certain elements of this, I think that we probably could find some consensus on it and, and move forward on. Okay, makes sense. So look, before we go to public comment, um, it sounds like, and I just wanna make sure I've got the process steps right, which is that if people have some additional kind of things, they'll send an email to Elena. Elena will sort out legally, I guess, or, or per whatever the Brown Act, if, if how she can then get that over to Ezra as the lead uh, for this subcommittee. Um, I think Ezra, did you accept um, our feedback, which is then I think next step, he would take some of these thoughts and ideas you have to Ashvini and team and see what they have to say. I mean, I think we need to talk with them. And then I know um, it's, it's, I mean, I, mean, I know our council liaison, Dan Carson also is quite, we could take it to him after you take it to city staff, you know, to say, hey, here's some other things, get some of his inputs um, as well. I'm Dan, I don't wanna speak for you, but I know you're usually willing to meet with people um, and go share your thoughts on things. And I think really get this to a point uh, where you've really got something concrete to say. And I really did like what Doug was saying about transparency on the, around in, impact fees. I, and that definitely resonates with me. Or is that reasonable, guys, for, from the process perspective? Because I like yeah, well, that you stuck your necks out. <laughs> I do. Let's, um, well, can we agree just that we'll meet as a subcommittee? Because um, Doug's been leading the interfacing with the city. And so, so it may be that, you know, he's still happy to do that. So I don't want to commit anybody other than the committee meeting to, to take all of these things forward. Is that okay? Okay, but I'm, I think what you're hearing from us is we would like the city staff to have the ability to, we will when do we that. say something is this, I, I, they need to tell us, this is why you're full of crap or this is why we disagree with you or whatever, you know, it's just, we, we that's their job. Yeah, no, okay. No, we'll, we're gonna action it. Fantastic, I love it. All right, I think we do need to take public comment. So let's go to that. Hey, if we have anybody would like to speak on Zoom, please uh, raise your hand. Otherwise, if you're on the phone, please press star nine. And I see no one, Michelle. Okay, excellent. So um, I really, again, appreciate you guys so much. I think it's a um, good step. All right, next up, Mr. Doug. All right. Housing element. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So I will give you guys a relatively quick update on the housing element committee um, meetings. We've had two meetings so far. I I apologize. I didn't get this to Karen in time, but I will send you all a um, two things. One is a summary of the last meeting that was put together by the chair, Greg Rowe, and another one is a memo that I submitted to the um, housing element committee about um, uh, policy issues that I think are important to consider, um, um, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a city. Um, and I will just let you know, as a summary, the memo that I sent to the um, Housing um, Element Committee, it focuses on one, one of the things that I believe is the reason that we have higher costs in Davis, higher housing costs, that's both rent and home um, values than surrounding communities. And I think that's because we have a, um, a supply constrained city, if you will. And that's due to a number of things. Um, one of which is uh, a 1% growth um, limit. Uh, another one is measure D. And then um, the other thing, I, I, I made an argument that I believe that inclusionary housing policy is harmful to housing affordability because it increases the cost of new housing so much. But anyway, I, again, and I understand not many people are gonna, under, gonna agree with, with those points or at least a lot of people won't. Um, but I will just summarize for you all, um, some, there are some um, ideas at the first two housing element committee meetings that have, that have been kind of recurring themes or, or things that I think uh, again, I don't want, want to say consensus, but there's some some broad uh, level of agreement on. Um, first of all, there's a there's a a very uh, significant concern uh, within the community and those on the on the committee 
about the affordability of housing or the lack thereof in the city of Davis. Um, most of you probably know that housing in Davis, both rents and home values are between 30 and 40 to 45% higher than in our surrounding communities. Uh, most of you may or may not know that rents um, in Davis on average are higher than rents in downtown Sacramento. Um, so at any rate, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of concern over that issue. Um, and there's a lot of advocates um, for capital A affordable housing. And um, I think that's in broad terms, it, it's, it's an interest of the people on the committee to, to um, help the city move towards policies that will help aid in the housing affordability um, problem. And um, again, that's going to be, I, I think that's, in my opinion, that's going to be a combination of more market rate housing, <laughs> as well as more capital A affordable housing. So that, that's one very, very broad theme that is, that is, um, comes up, um, you know, consistently. Um, another thing that has come up more than once now, and I think that may have um, fairly broad um, interest is um, a concept of a housing trust fund in order to help um, fund um, affordable housing opportunities. And um, I think that this is already in place. I think the Social Services Commission wrote a um, kind of a, a white paper about this. And I think that at least one of the developments that was approved in the past few years is will be making a contribution to uh, an affordable housing trust fund, which is a um, you know, the funds from that could be used, you know, for um, a wide variety of uses that all would generally support um, affordable housing opportunities in, in the city. Um, one of the things that I, th I think it would be interesting for um, either our subcommittee or another to, to address or to look into is how, what are some viable ways of funding a housing, um, uh, affordable housing trust fund? And a couple of ideas that have been uh, floated. One is a parcel tax. Another one would be um, a, like a in lieu fee that developers pay. And there's another one uh, that came up, which is a transfer tax. So when someone sells their house uh -huh. in Davis, uh, there's a transfer tax that's collected by the county that then would be go, go into an houseable, um, sorry, affordable housing trust fund. So this might be something of interest to people on on the committee um, to talk about, uh, or, or you know, a subcommittee, maybe it's a community development subcommittee, to look into and, and provide some recommendations. Um, but uh, that's like I said that's that's another thing that's been um, ha there's a recurring theme that it's been brought up a few times, and it, I think there's broad support for it. And the last thing that I think there's um, fairly broad support of is the um, Right now, we have a 1% growth cap, which was, um, I think, passed back in the middle 2000s. And um, according to Greg Rowe, my understanding is it was passed in part because uh, our schools were under pressure. And um, so I think that there's, there's some, you know, I, you know, level of, I think, support for the idea of maybe um, recommending to city council that the 1% growth cap be um, uh, eliminated again, as in, in as um, just because it is a um, you know it is it is it is a, it is something that constrains the um, provision of new housing in Davis, which which affects the market obviously, and 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 uh, we think increases home values and prices and costs. So that's that's my summary. Um, I don't know if. If if Michelle, you want me to take questions, probably not. I can't remember, but uh, let me no, know. No, you. Uh, I think. Oh, is that me making the horrible noise? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, boy, I heard like sounded like dragons. Um, yeah, I think we can take a couple of questions. I mean, I I think maybe my I have a quick question for you, which is, I know that. Obviously, the whole affordability, affordable housing. I mean, we're not the only community in California. In fact, I can't imagine that there is a community not struggling with a similar type problem. I mean, is are you guys learning and finding things from other groups? You know, what they're doing. 
Um, well, uh, yes, I will on my private time as a homework assignment. Um, and, you know, as again, I think we all bring different uh, experiences to the discussion, but as a group, as a housing com element committee, our task is really more more focused than that. It's really the preparation of this specific, specific part of the document yeah. that we have to submit to the state. And these these higher level policy discussions are, again, they're, they're really um, not perfectly on point as to the mission of this, this committee. We're and really you're also being specific to Davis as well, like the 1%, uh, yeah, exactly. all of those things that you're looking at. Okay, great. People with, with thought, can I, I can't see the darn hand. Michelle, we have uh, Paul Jacobs and Ezra Beeman with hand up. Very Paul's quick, first. very quick right. question, uh, which is, we doesn't the Area Council of Governments have quotas that we have to meet under some kind of sanction if we don't meet them? Uh, and what would that be for Davis? Yeah, so that's true. Now, I think I updated you all on this point last let the uh, last time I gave you an update. But our um, the housing element cycle is like a seven year cycle. So the last one was 2013 to through the end of 2019, and the, and the next one is 2020 through 2027, I believe. And the the housing target that we had to meet during the previous cycle uh, was roughly around figures of thousand how new new homes and a certain percentage of those have to be available to lower income families at various different affordability levels. Um, the next cycle um, that goes through, you know, I think it's 2028, um, we will, that, that quota will double effectively. It's uh, like 2,065 units or something in that range. So um, the, um, you know, this is a real challenge, obviously, with limited land resources. Um, last, last cycle, we were able to make the um, quota mainly because of um, the, uh, the cannery was built out in the early part of the last cycle. And then, um, um, the, let's see, the Grande, Grande Homes here in North Davis was built out. There's like 40 or 50 homes. And then there was a slew of uh, new apartment projects that happened in the late 20-teens, 2017, 18, 19, 20, <laughs> Sterling Fifth Street, um, these you know, as, as an example. So there was a lot of new development that came through that was unanticipated, frankly, that allowed, that, that allowed Davis to, to meet the quota from the last period. Going forward, I think it's gonna be a challenge and that's something we're looking at is where are the resources to create these housing units? One innovative approach is to allow for the construction of a, a accessory dwelling units. That's so I have a I have a house on a six thousand square foot lot in North Davis. I can build a little apartment in my backyard, kind of thing. And that's there's been some success with uh, Davis has a, a policy that allows for access, accessory dwelling units in single family homes, home lots, and there has been some success with that. But it you know. So, so there's there's a lot of innovation, innovative approaches taking part, and um, so it's certainly going to be a challenge, I think, in the next cycle. Hey, Doug. Um, oh, sorry, are you done, Paul? Yeah, thank you very much. Good answer, and appreciate your work. Uh, so, yeah, I would I would add my thanks, Doug, uh, for spending the time on our behalf, or at least on the commission's behalf, for being there. Um, I think there's three questions, statements that I'd like to make. One is, um, I think the committee really has to get a good understanding about what drives prices in Davis. I've had a really deep dive on that with a lot of data. And I looked at uh, sort of peer communities like Roseville and, um, oh, what's the other one? Elk Road? No, awesome. I'm 50. Folsom? Folsom? Yeah, Folsom. And I tried to understand, you know, what was different about what they've done compared to what Davis has done. And I looked at unit rates and I looked at growth rates. And just for what it's worth, what my where I landed was 
our house prices, I think, are strongly driven by UCD's growth rate. Uh, and you see, whenever historically UCD's growth rate sort of went up, and we didn't keep track, we didn't track it. You saw some pretty strong growth in housing prices. Um, so anyway, I'm just saying we can do a lot of stuff and not fix the problem. So I think studying, you know, what is driving the situation would be really important. Uh, the other thing, and you and I have talked about this before, but I'm going to air it with everyone else, um, which is, you know. I don't think, well, one way to get uh, our, our places affordable as everywhere else is to just get a 30% reduction in the value of our homes, right? And I think that's gonna scare a lot of people. So I think when you talk about smart uh, ways of doing it um, by changing planning requirements for average sizes of homes, um, there's ways that we can, we can, we can offer, um, you know, living in Davis uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily, it's not a zero sum game, I guess is where I'm going for. And then we find innovative solutions for that. My final statement is, you know, I think this fund idea has a, has a lot going for it. I'd be happy to put my hand up to help work to come up with the right economics and financial modeling uh, to try and figure out, um, you know, how we, uh, how it would work that, you know, it, it, it doesn't leak value or um, inappropriately allocate cost, I guess. Thanks. Good stuff. Okay, anybody else with a, a comment to Doug? Yeah, again, I think on behalf of the whole commission, uh, Doug. Do yeah. we get credit for housing in Metro Davis? In other words, if there's a dorm put up on the campus, would that count? Um, no, my understanding is that that would not count. Um, it's it's a city of Davis and it's um, the, the lines are very, you know, uh, very clearly drawn, if you will. And um, it, it's the city's allocation and it's the, uh, it's the number of units that are constructed in the city. Dan, do you, do you am I right on that? That's right. Um, we're, they're a different jurisdiction. Interesting. All right, anyone else? Again, Doug, we all thank you for, for doing and putting in the hours on the housing element uh, subcommittee uh, representing FBC. You always make us proud, so thank you. Uh, now I'd like to take some public comment on item 6C. If we have any public commenters, please raise your hand or dial star nine. And I see none. Okay, excellent. All right, um, we are going to move on to item six D, which is the subcommittee um, restructure and feedback. Um, Donna is going to lead us um, in this uh, discussion. Um, I think the memo was a pretty thorough. Um, I will say that um, Ezra. Um, it was like you had read our mind <laughs> when um, you then came in with an actual subcommittee tackling something specific, even one of the things that we had recommended. So it was just wonderful when things like that um, come together. And I, I still commend you guys, even though I can disagree with you. Um, I commend I commend that 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 which you were going for there. So um, Don, I'm going to turn it over to you to run this part of it. Great, thanks, Michelle. And as you probably all saw when you read the memo, it has sort of two parts. The first part is a summary of the meeting that Michelle and I had with our council liaisons about a month ago, where they gave us some really helpful feedback, both just some general comments about how well we're doing, and also some specific ideas for things we can work on. And then part B of the, the document that you have is a little bit of a proposal for sort of transforming our existing subcommittees in the hope that we can be more efficient and get ourselves just a little bit more in conformity with, with the Brown Act. Um, I'm not gonna belabor the whole uh, memo. I know you've had a chance to read it, but I'm just gonna run through some of the major points that came away from our meeting with uh, Mayor Partita and Council Member Carson. Um, they were very helpful and gave us lots of great feedback. Um, they told us some of the things that we had done that were very helpful. In particular, the analysis that we did related to DISC and University Mall, those developments and the questions that we posed helped make that process more informed. 
Um, one sort of constructive criticism that we heard from them was that sometimes we have a bit of a tendency uh, to kind of rehash old issues over and over without moving forward toward a constructive solution. And what they would really, they really appreciate our work and what they want to see from us is, us, you know, for us to come up with real solutions to problems and to work past that. And they gave us some examples of areas where we could do that. And one in particular that came up in our meeting has to do with the Leland model, where as a commission, we've had a lot of discussions about how the marginal cost should be calculated. And, and I, it was actually a great meeting for me because it was the first time I actually heard the whole history of the issue. And I understood that prior commission, our prior membership of our commission had actually committed to working on this issue and coming up with some alternative other than the one that is currently in the model, because there's some recognition already that it does need some, some work. So that was one area. Um, and again, the point that, that uh, uh, Council Member Carson really emphasized was that for us to be really effective, we need to really become solution oriented, coming up with um, fixes, recommended fixes to the problems that we identify and support it with some sort of written analysis, just the way you know, Ezra and your subcommittee, you're, you were already envisioning that kind of thing, and that's fantastic. Um, some of the particular things that they mentioned, they already hit on the fact that they mentioned that we work on the marginal cost issue we identified in the Leland model. That would be of use to city council. Another issue they had identified is the fact that we've talked quite a few times in our meetings about these costs that uh, fire and police departments incur when they do what they call pickup calls, where someone is fallen and they go and they pick up the person in a number of different, as we all know, if we've ever experienced this, you have a fire, usually a fire truck and many different vehicles responding to your house. Some uh, municipalities in California actually charge certain, have a fee structure for those kinds of calls. Just the suggestion was that we do some research and look at what other California cities might do in that area. Another recommendation, which I think is also really helpful, and this Ezra is kind of like what you were, you were doing in your proposal was to go back, well, in this case, it wasn't a completed development project, it was one that didn't pass, but to go back, look at a development project that's completed, and then look at how the fiscal model compares to the reality. Do that analysis, because that would help us really refine the fiscal model. Um, another comment, and this came from Mayor Partito, was as we move through the next general plan process, for us to really be focusing on what economic strategies the city should use, especially as they're coming out of a recession and dealing with the impact of COVID. Obviously, that's a fairly broad uh, recommendation, but nonetheless, one the city council would see as adding real value. And, and then finally, um, we talked just a little bit about sponsoring forums for citizens and community members as a way of performing outreach and developing solutions to problems because apparently the city does have a, a platform that we could use securely that would be a great way it would be a great way for us as a commission to really get some community feedback on issues so if there are topics we wanted to pursue in that kind of forum we could do that um, that's kind of the summary in a nutshell of our feedback that we got from them. If you have clarifying questions about that, I'm happy to answer them now. And then I was just gonna kind of move into the proposal that came out of that um, discussion. And I see, Ezra, you have a question? Ezra, I see your hand up. Yep, thanks. Um, well, just one thing, I mean, I wanna be clear that we worked on that, um, the, the inputs to that paper as a, as a team. I mean, if there's any like errors in there, they're mine. But I just, you know, I'm uncomfortable saying that that was something that, that I did uh, on my own. I just want to clear, uh, clarify that. Uh, the other question I had uh, was I didn't understand the margin. I, I just want to be clear on the marginal cost Leland issue. I think this is the dividing everything on a variable basis. Is that the marginal cost? So Dan's got his hand up. Yeah, Dan, please go ahead. Yeah, it's not the Leland model. Actually, we were referring. Yeah, I should have caught that. Sorry. Uh, development imp fiscal impact model, um, and so back uh, when the last time Finance and Budget Commission reviewed the model as a whole, not individual projects, but we were helping to refine the model itself. Um, there was consensus at the time that um, that was we sort of viewed it version 2.0 and we said 
Well, we probably need to at some point move on to version 3.0, which is to try instead of uh, the 75% uh, variable versus fixed, which was basically a compromise between the commission's position of a lower amount and an initial city staff position that was higher. I think we all understood that that was a, a compromise and that there was an analytical approach that you could take to try to refine what is the true marginal cost. Um, at least a better estimate that you could use on a routine basis in modeling. Because of course, for every individual project, yeah, so, some of the assumptions could change, but if you don't have a model with certain rules of thumb, it becomes impossible for staff to use. So that's, that's what we had talked about a few years ago, back when I was chair. Yeah, and apologies, I, Donna, I should have caught that it, sh it should be the fiscal impact model, not the Leland model. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for the correction and I appreciate yeah. it. And, and Ezra too, I mean, I, it was interesting to me because you kind of were already hitting, hinting at this issue in your document. And it is one that more than hinting, yeah. <laughs> more than hinting. And he's and, got a, a point of view, yeah. And, and I'll just say too, in in not to pick on us or anything, but you know, it's a, an issue that the council would value, you know, our input on and our analysis. But at the same time, it is one that I think where we we need to recognize that some things are going to be a kind of a no go, like some suggestions we, we probably really want to make sure we coordinate with our liaison because there may be some suggestions we come up with here that just are not going to fly because they're not going to be feasible so we want to really coordinate on that someone else had their oh paul you have your hand up yeah i in terms of the steps you're proposing i have a couple of points to make i like the idea that you want us to be more specific and in writing on things that we can take action on. Uh, Wait, are you jumping to the Part to me, B? Not, hold on, hold on. Can, are you jumping to Part B? Which I'm is jumping to Part structure? B, but, okay. Yeah. But can, it seems to me that we have two functions. One is kicking the tires. Uh, city does something like we do in an, uh, the city brought in a consultant report. We look at it, we critique it, we ask questions. Sometimes that results in changes even when we don't make specific proposals. I don't think we want to lose that. Oh, I agree. I agree, Paul. And I'll, I'm going to talk about that. Do you want me to move ahead to part B? I'm, I'm just, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll no worries. I just my questions. If people had questions about the feedback from uh, Mayor Partita and Councilmember Carson, and I'd move into that other part, because you're right. So I want to make sure I hit on that. And I don't see any other hands up. So that was our feedback. It was super helpful. Um, and then, so then what you have kind of in part B, and I just want to step through this quickly, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but for all of us, our goal is obviously it's to be as useful and effective as we can to city council. And so we, we kind of recognized over time that the existing subcommittee process that we had probably needed to be restructured a little bit. You know, for a while now, we've had these subcommittees that are sort of broad subject matter subcommittees, and we thought it would be a lot more effective if instead we really focused on very specific goals we're trying to achieve within a period of time. And doing that is also uh, much more in much more consistent with the Brown Act and what the Brown Act really expects of subcommittees that don't meet openly. You really are supposed to be more like ad hoc temporary committees. So the general concept here that you see in part B is, is intended to take what were existing sort of almost standing committees and kind of forget the word, but blow them up, kind of abolish them, but be sure to capture what we're doing and what you're doing in um, your current work in these new formed temporary ad hoc committees to make them more task oriented and more goal oriented. And the attempt was to capture everything that's ongoing. I didn't mean to leave something off the plate that someone's working on that I don't know about. So I, that's where I, I went through the list of current subcommittees and work plans and I tried to capture ongoing work. And then of course we can always form new other subcommittee. You know, it's very easy to form an ad hoc temporary subcommittee. We can just do it quickly, put it on the agenda and do it in any meeting. So, 
that's part sort of the first part of this. And then the other part of the proposal really is just the idea that it's super helpful for not only for us as commissioners, but for the council, if when we perform this work and analysis, we give our fellow commissioners something to kind of read in advance. It does not need to be lengthy. It does not need to be a long detailed analysis. It might just be a summary of research or some great report you found and why you think you know, that lends itself to doing more research. That's okay, but just something in writing, even if short, so we really know kind of what your thoughts are, what problem you're trying to tackle, tackle, and then we can move forward in a public meeting and discuss it and really make progress. I mean, that's what we're trying to trying to achieve here. So that's that's kind of our proposal in a nutshell. And I'm happy to answer questions and then we can take public comment after questions. And I see hands up from David Sandino and Paul Jacobs. So David, please go ahead. I just want to try to better understand it. So my, my read of it is that if there's a, a current uh, subcommittee, such as the one I'm on, the public safety, that subcommittee now is going to be abolished. And I think that's true for all the subcommittee. But if there's an existing work activity that's going on, that work activity will continue, but it will be under a different name. Is that an accurate summary? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it'll be you'll be a newly formed ad hoc committee. And just for that purpose, the purpose of the work you're doing, and then we can always form, you know, as other things that you want to tackle come up, you can always form a different ad hoc committee, or you can work, you know, we can work with other people on that. But yes, that is that is the intent of this. So from my standpoint, that that's okay. I thought the advantage of this subcommittee was to develop expertise among those subcommittee members, and that might be lost in this uh, new proposal. I think that's something that the uh, uh, commission should talk about. Uh, the other thing that, that jumped out at me, um, and this is a bigger issue, and it's kind of vexed me from the beginning when I started uh, less than a, about a year ago, is what is the role of the commission uh, and staff and consultants? because all the to-dos are all the recommendations by the council and the things that the commission is work, working on. Um, I'm sure we could do a fine job, but I also think though that uh, the city staff could do a good job or a city consultant would do a good job and we may get that work product more quickly and more efficiently if it was carried out by staff or consultants and then the commission should, could come in and review it. And there's also advantage if you have city staff to work on some of these things instead of the commission, you develop professional expertise within the city staff and they get some sense of accomplishment. So I'm, I'm interested in what was the thinking or if there ever has been any thinking about the division of labor. What falls under the commission subcommittee's work product versus having some other um, aspect of the city do it? Is it just because we have volunteers that want to work on it and that makes sense? Or is there some strategy here? I'm, I'm curious about that. And if folks are willing to share their opinions, I'd be interested. Yeah, those are all great points. And I don't know, um, Dan, if you want to talk a little about that, because I know we've had conversations along those lines too, in terms of what is our role? And I don't know if you want to join in or if other members sure. want to comment on that. Well, uh, sure. And, uh, and, but with one hesitation that you've heard me voice before, which is as you're deciding how to organize yourselves, um, I d don't want to tell you how to advise me as a council member. I want you to do whatever you think is most effective. But in terms of the specific question of what do you work on versus what others do. Um, first of all, we've tried to give you a mission. Uh, uh, we, we've, we've laid it out. That was actually really good work. One of the very first things Michelle Weiss worked on is to define what the responsibilities of S FBC were in general. And so that's, that's one guidance. Another bit of guidance, but it's not meant to be handcuffs, is the council each year adopts, uh, I'm sorry, every two year cycle adopts goals and it adopts objectives. Um, 
And, and so where you see an opportunity in particular to help further those things, um, I think those are things you, that you can do that are especially helpful. I also will say that my, my recommendation to my colleagues and staff has been as we kick off a new two year cycle on Tuesday, I am urging us to again do a retreat in a couple of months to reset the goals and objectives, consider afresh what we wanna focus on. And I have proposed that all of our commissions, as has occurred in the past, be given an opportunity to weigh in and tell us what should those goals and objectives be so that you're involved at the front end and have, maybe have some more buy-in and, and, and to ex expend energy on to accomplish that. You are right that there are things council members actually develop as policy proposals. Our staff develops things, individual commissioners, outside interest groups, members of the public. So there's a lot of folks engaging on issues and we welcome where you see the gap, where you see you could do the most good, um, you should jump in. So to go back to my FPC days, an example I'll use is I had a long history of involvement with the UC Davis campus city relationship, was actually involved in litigation uh, about that way back to 2003. And when I saw a new long range development plan was coming, um, I did the research and wrote a sort of white paper for my commission to review that looked at how Santa Cruz and Berkeley did binding and, and um, enforceable MOUs to get stuff for their communities to help offset the impacts of the growth of their campuses. And I explained what those other communities did, gave examples of, of things that seemed to be particularly pertinent to Davis and offered a general recommendation that this commission supported that the council in the next go around here should pursue such a thing for Davis. And um, I think that changed the world here. It had a huge impact. It persuaded the council. And it just so happened I walked in the door to be on that council just as the long range development plan was released. But I think there are other areas I can point to where, where um, this commission made a difference. And I will say to the extent that you can deliver um, brief but pertinent and clearly written products, Gloria and I, when we're sitting here, we are listening to everything you say. We can't always be here. Sometimes I had three commissions meeting at once, but also you need to get the message out directly and independently to my, our three council colleagues as well. So I think there's a way to deliver things that can have a significant impact. Did that get to Thank your you. question? David, you're on mute. It, it did, it did. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm coming from, I'm really sensitive to city staff. I want them, I want, I've got a project with them. They're really busy. Uh, on the other hand, I think we have city staff that has expertise. And if we needed a product right away, I'm not sure if there's a conversation as what's the best way to produce it. But I think all the things we've identified, the city staff could provide a work product and probably do it more quickly. And we'd have the commission in review mode yeah. and we'd get something. So I, I, I could see it, it could go both ways. You gave a good example where you took the initiative and did something with the UCD uh, City of Davis relationship and maybe staff could have done it, but you, you took the opportunity. So I, I see that as a, as a potential path. But maybe, maybe the answer is we really need, if we're gonna do a project before we get started with it, we need to have the conversation as to who is the best uh, member of the Davis community, I'm thinking larger, that should take the lead on it sure. and have a reasonable chance of getting it done in a professional manner. And it may not be me on one of my projects, for instance, it may be somebody else. So that's, that's all, all I think what I would suggest for that. And I'll just say, there's a lot of talent on this commission and our other commissions. 
Thank you. I mean, that's a really helpful point. And I, I appreciate all these comments because I know one of the conversations I had when I interviewed for the commission was from those interviewing me at the time was don't go off and do something without a check-in. You know, as you're saying, David, find out if you're going to embark on a project, find out maybe a consultant's already working on it. Maybe city staff has got it right in their pocket. They know what they're doing. Maybe not. Maybe they want our help. But keeping up that communication and making sure that we know that what we, we're going to do is valuable and we're really the best person to do it is, I think it's really important. And that's what Gloria and I are here to do. Okay. Donna, do you see the process for forming a new ad hoc subcommittee to be a, an individual first puts a write up into the upcoming agenda and then at the next subcommittee meeting or at the next committee meeting, um, it'll be discussed and then there would be a motion for the ad hoc committee. What is it all in the span of that meeting that mm -hmm. the decision for an ad hoc committee is made? You could do it in, in one meeting. So if you have a proposal, you've got something great you want to do and you've already figured out if your subcommittee is the best to do it, you come forward with a proposal, agendize it, and we vote on it as a commission. It shouldn't be this long, you know, two meeting process. We only meet once a month. We should be able to do that and give you guidance. Donna, could we not have, for example, when we heard again from the fire department and we went back over the lift expense call thing and and we and he said yeah i heard some other cities are doing that i'd be interested in that but basically said i don't have the resource resources to kind of look into that kind of thing could we not have said at that time hey i would be really interested in going off and doing that does anybody want to join me and then we could have made a motion to go for you know let's say me and ray to go up and look at that kind of thing could we have done that like that just like that right during a yeah as long as your agenda gives enough notice that that's a possible action you can tell i've defended too many bagley keen lawsuits can't you <laughs> yes, yes you can but again that was that was in the report yeah. and we well, discussed it with them and we said hey would that be and so then it's like well we'd like to you know or we could even just okay so you you would if we wanted to be super safe, we could have gone off, let's say me and Ray said we're really interested, we could have gone off and prepared something to say, we, this is our proposal. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. By the way, I skipped a step on my example and I apologize, is it okay if I explain? Sure, of course. We had, at, back then we had created a subcommittee structure and one of them was a subcommittee on revenue options and we, came up with a list of specific revenue options. And one of them was, can we get some dang money out of this university? And that's- You and Al Zeta, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that led us going down the path of doing the work. So I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I, I have a question, uh, several point, uh, points to make. I'll try to do it really quickly. The, the city council has sub, a subcommittee structure those subcommittee meetings, including the pavement committee uh, that, that came up with a, the high, our highly praised, uh, your highly praised recommendations on pavement. Those were not public meetings. Now you could argue that was ad hoc. They but were. The city also has a number of standing subcommittees and they do not publicly notice when they meet. As far as I know, I mean, maybe some of them do. So I think, and, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Paul. I apologize. And the city knows and they're working on fixing that. They know. So well, I'd, yeah, might... I'd like some guidance on that. Yeah. They're gonna the city attorney's gonna be giving a memo. And, and Kelly was really excited to see that we were making this change here. And she's gonna be giving some guidance on that line between standing and ad hoc. And she's trying to work on it with some of the the city council and others. And and I thought I'd also like to say that the purpose of the I like a lot of the suggestions here. And I think I have a compromise if we can keep our subcommittee structure. The subcommittee structure, as David said, allows you to get to know one part of the whole thing, of the whole budget, of the whole structure of the city. You can use it as Michelle and I did. We met the, the head of HR who is fairly recent and is very, very good and very impressive. And she, we talked to her about a lot of things about releasing such things as 
uh, comparative salaries that are used in negotiations once the negotiations are completed. Uh, I don't know if we influenced the release of those. Maybe we did. It was, never came before the commission as a whole, but I think our interactions were, were helpful both to us and our understanding of the city uh, and, and to the staff in terms of what we, we as a communications and administration subcommittee saw as being helpful to increase city, the transparency of what the city was doing. Uh, but, and I also think that when the budget comes around and there are way, other ways to handle this, we would, those subcommittees that specialize would be in a much better position to look at the budget and the proposals that are built into the budget uh, in a much more granular way, as people now say, than, than we would as a commission as a whole. So uh, it seems to me that what you're really after here, depending on what is legally permissible, of course, is you want our subcommittees, the, uh, the work we do either as a ad hoc or standing subcommittees to be much more focused and not scattered. In other words, you want us to pick an achievable project <laughs> and, a, and produce a work product. And I, uh, one last point that I would make is that one of the things, we don't necessarily have to investigate things exhaustively. It might be, David, that at some point you say, uh, we, we should bring in an outside consultant or uh, to look at how we're going about uh, per making major public safety purchases or, or, or maybe, I think you made that same point. It may be that you'll never get enough information. You'll get a sampling of information maybe and it will be enough to suggest that something larger and perhaps beyond the scope of volunteers is necessary. We don't have to necessarily come up with a solution. Um, Donna, yeah. hi, I just wanted to kind of uh, step in and just kind of let you guys know that I understand that our city attorney will be providing some additional information on exactly what um, um, Paul is talking about at the moment. So um, kind of giving some guidance um, yeah. on that as well. Yeah. So I just wanted to let everybody know. I did mention it and I was gonna, thank you, Elena. I was gonna mention that again. I was just gonna, I'm sorry, Paul, are you? Paul, you I, I'm, I'm pretty finished. I think there is some benefit. We could resurrect the current committee structure on an ad hoc basis to review the budget, for example. When the budget comes in, people who are the most familiar with those things could become an ad hoc subcommittee to look at it. As long as we don't need an extra meeting ahead of time to right. set that up. Yes. Uh, that, no, what I worry about is when you need to be agile, sometimes you don't, you don't want to have an extra meeting to decide who to assign to do something. Totally agree. And, you know, I'm going to give some thought to that. And as Elena said, the city attorney is kind of working on this issue across the board. I completely respect this concern about subject matter expertise. And what we're just trying to do is work ourselves into a process that allows us to be efficient, and nimble, consistent with the Brown Act and use our expertise. So points are all well taken. Yes, absolutely. Donna, yeah, we do have Ray and Ezra also asking to speak on the point. Yeah, I can I can see hands. Thanks so much. Ray, you want to hear? Yeah, I, when I read the uh, report, I eliminate uh, immediately eliminated the word subcommittee and replaced it with task force. And as I look at my tenure on the committee, which will be, you know, ending in a few months. I think where we've really gotten things done is where there was a specific time bound task ahead of us. You know, the University Mall, DISC, MRIC, et cetera. And so I love the idea of just completely disbanding the subcommittees and forming specific groups relative to tasks. I would say, however, that I think we need to continue the process of rotating through the departments so that we can identify certain tasks we may want to look at. 
I mean, the one that comes to mind was the report uh, by the fire department, the mention of the desire for a ladder truck. And I think that cries out for a task force to take a look at what would it take, for example, to hire ladder truck services from UC Davis. How often is their truck used? What are the creative options, et cetera? So I just think we do need that kind of generic process to identify certain tasks that are not put in front of us. All understood. You have a question? You're on mute. No, I think Ray raises a good point. I think somewhere in between, uh, but I like the idea of a task force. That's what we've done. I mean, we've assigned people as essentially ad hoc committees to make, re to communicate uh, finance and budget commission views to staff. And we've done that in the past and I think it's, it's worked and I don't see any reason to abandon that. I do think it's sometimes a good idea to have people who are looking ahead to what's coming down the pike as a standing committee. But if we can't do that, we can't do it. Yeah, it's just unfortunately that true standing committees have to meet publicly. I'm not opposed to that, but it would just create a lot more work for city staff. So, Ezra, I'm sorry, please, you, you still have your hand up, right? So, yeah, um, am I understanding correctly that uh, if we keep the existing structure, we're all going to have public meetings on subcommittees? No, no, no. We're, that's what we're trying to make sure that we're conforming to the Brown Act exceptions that allow for non-public meetings, that allow you to be more agile. Okay. So there's kind of this fine line between a standing and an ad hoc. All other considerations, you know, about expertise and all that taken into account. But I think there's a, a way to be consistent with the Brown Act and still be really effective, you know, and quick. And I'll give more thought to how we have the quickest and nimblest way to form the ad hocs. So you can really get work, right to work on what you want to do. And as Elena said, Inder, the city attorney is going to be, this is a kind of an across the board issue. And she's going to be providing some further guidance to city council and commissions on it. Okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. And again, thank you for taking up the challenge of writing a paper. I mean, it, you know, it's hard. I, we, we all know that uh, <laughs> it takes effort. So appreciate that. And, you know, restructuring anything is um, fraught with peril. I think when I read it, some of the things uh, that resonated with me is like, I'm chairing the, um, the, the the parks and rec and infrastructure and I can't, you know, have been difficult to meet. There's been another sort of super committee over here. So I was like, you, you know, and I spent most of my time working on the community development subcommittee. So, you know, it, it seemed like it energies could be used maybe better elsewhere until we can start meeting with folks uh, on a more normal basis. Um, in addition to some of the concerns though around specialization and you know how valuable that is, um, I think the thing that I worry about is if I like if I've got a something I want to work on, I can I can bounce it off my subcommittee, right? And we're able to sort of iterate through stuff and talk about it. And so I know if we get through the three of us, that we at least have three votes that are going to be in favor of it, and we only have to win, you know, one or, or you know. Uh, however many we've got, sorry, on the committee. So there's also a iterative, an iterative thing, but I also see the value of, hey, there's an issue that's come up, you know, you triage it to which committee it goes to and, and they could be a task force. So I don't, you know, there's no one perfect answer. I think there's pros and cons on, on both sides, but in thinking this through, do consider how, how, a, how task force would be assigned. I mean, it's one thing to do top down, but like one thing I've been working on and I hope to bring it next time is in the realm of economic development. And this is focused on uh, local content. And uh, in doing some of my own research, I found that everybody, uh, Sacramento's got it, San Francisco's got it, you know, everybody's got local content, but Davis, uh, and then working through the multipliers and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I, I guess I could bring that, that would never come off, well, that might come off a, hey, we need more money, what are some good ideas? Uh, sort of discussion. I just I, I sort of worry about the bubbling up part of. of so, Ezra, tell me because I I know that we were trying to be 
conscious of the fact that in your the subcommittee that you're on with Doug and, and Gurkern, it, it's really broad. And so in reforming it, we were trying to kind of give you as much breath as we could, which is economic analysis of major projects. Maybe that wording needs to be a little more encompassing, but even in writing that, we knew that we couldn't leave you intact for five years because then you'd seem, then you would be more like a standing committee. We knew that. So we're balancing these factors in the Brown Act and we wanna give you enough latitude to do what you're trying to do at least in the coming 24 months. That's really the goal of, of how this is written. So I don't know if there's some wording that should change there. Well, in the context of a major, uh, you know, improving the economics of major projects, I think there's, you know, it's 12 months of work just on that alone. But I'm saying there's, there's another thing over here, which is how do we create more revenues for the city outside of major projects, right? And this comes down to the city using more internal services so that people who live and work here are getting more revenue and that gets through to taxes and, and all the rest of it. Then that is a separate that would have to be just a separate one. It's nothing to do with the subcommittee for economic analysis of major projects. And it sounds like you're suggesting that you have another ad hoc group called local content. Sounds good enough. Right. Um, and does anyone, if you would say, does anyone else want to work with you on it? Yeah, I think that's the process okay. that you're outlining here. Yeah, um, so I wonder, does anyone want to work with Ezra on that? Does I'm everyone know what local would. content is? I didn't know what it was. Right. To you have to source locally, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, explain it. Well, so um, many um, city organizations, and we've done found research for uh, Sacramento, San Diego. I mean, the bigger cities that um, that we've we've looked at, um, they have a local uh, sourcing requirement, and it ranges. Like if you're building roads, it's so much. If you're doing reports on economics, it's so much. But the intention is to um, encourage, uh, or sorry. Um, favor local businesses up to some percentage and it ranges ranges from like five percent of the contract to 30 and I, i've got it all together and ready to go um but you know i haven't brought it to my what was the old subcommittee right which is the natural place for it because it's under community development uh, sorry community and economic development i should be clear so i guess my plan was to still bring it to uh to gurkhan and 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 doug and see what they thought but if anybody else wants to you know, be involved in that, then, then let me know. Sounds like the pro, how would the process for, for that ad hoc subcommittee look? So I'm just gonna suggest because we already have a program like that. And I guess my first suggestion before we form an ad hoc committee is to check back with city staff on it. My understanding is we've already got something like that in place, unless I'm mistaken. We do, and um, I've never seen a tender come out that says if you work here or your business is based here, we're going to give you oh, 500 okay. points, well, or we, you need to have a minimum 20% local content. I'm not. No, you're right. okay. it is different from what I'm thinking of. Okay. Um, if you want to, that can be a part of what we do this evening is forming, and it can be the same three people you're working on with your other issue because you have expertise. That's not a problem. Okay. Meet so up it's the same Monday when we ever get to meet a lot, you know, in the same place together. And you, from 10 to 11, you're at the ad hoc committee for blah. And then at 11 to 12, you're the other one. That's okay. So Donna, are, are you okay with that particular one being added tonight? And it sounds like it's well, Ezra it's, and then- The will of the committee. Then, Maybe before we think it's a good idea, I, I put up a trial balloon again and then we, oh, I see it's hard. Why don't we put so agendize good. it next week, next time? Why don't we agendize this next time? I would think you would put that on the agenda. He would then explain what he wants to do and makes a proposal for a, a, an ad hoc. Does that seem right, Donna? Yeah, that's fine too. Okay. I, All right. You know, I, I, would I would object to that. I think he's done some work. Uh, why don't we, can't he now go to the two members on his existing committee that we think is may or may not be legal, but we've been operating and he can act as if it were an ad hoc committee and polish his report and bring it back to us as an action item. We can just, we can- That way we, we, we save, we save a month. Month. We could just form it as a named ad hoc committee, just like he did. So and we can do and it I'm right doing now. it. I'm trying to make a motion, that's why. So I needed to know if it was in or out. Okay. Do you, oh, is there any more comment back for Donna? I know we've, we've 
gone over here. I, I, I do think. So we have hands up, Michelle. David has his Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see it. Damn it. I can't see the hand up. Go ahead, David. Sorry. Well, I see we're heading to a motion and I'm not voting and I, I'm fine, whatever the group decides, but it would seem best to me to wait until we see this opinion from the city attorney and how these different possibilities are scoped out, uh, the possibilities of, of, a, of a standing committee versus an ad hoc committee. And that might guide us in our formation or we can do it and then adjust afterwards. But that's, that's what I would, I would wait. I would wait until next month. So I don't see any other hands up. Um, we haven't taken public comments. So I think we should go to public comment and then kind of come back and sure. further deliberation. So let's go for that. Elena, is there anybody who wants to speak? I am looking right now and no, we do not have anybody. Perfect. So members, further comments, what's your desire in terms of what you'd like to do? Are you looking for a motion tonight, uh, future chair? Or? That is, it's up to the will of the committee whether you want to act on this tonight. There's been a suggestion to hold off until we get the guidance from Inder. Um, yep. It's, you know. I'll throw a trial balloon. I move approval of the memo as written. And I don't hear a second. So is there a counter motion? I would, I, I, well, I'm just wondering, is the memo, yeah. Okay, the, the only thing it doesn't have is Ezra's additional subcommittee, which I think we just developed. So I would make a friendly motion to yours to um, add accept, I accept. the subcommittee for local content. I accept. Okay. Which would in essence abolish the existing structure and put in the new ad hoc. Okay, so I'm, um, okay, so. Is there? So I second it. Well, you made a friendly amendment to the motion. Oh, shoot, someone else. Do we have a second to the motion, to that motion? I'll second it. So Doug is seconding it. And so members, uh, any further comments, deliberations on the motion? Can I say something? All right. Absolutely. Go ahead, Esra. I'm raising my hand really so it'll help Michelle. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I, I feel um, I feel like if it doesn't work, we can always go back. So I feel with that in mind um, that I would be supportive of it um, just to try something new because I certainly haven't met with my subcommittee for I don't know how long and, it, you know. It's not working. Yeah. It's not working and we're, we're in violation of Brown. Actually, I think that it's like. Yeah. Can I, I don't understand how we're in violation of Brown. I, th I thought you said that. Sorry, she said that. Help. I, should, that, I, I strike that from the record. You say that out loud in a meeting. <laughs> it's a fine oh. line, and Inder's, Inder's working up some guidance. We've had some conversations, and, and you know, I, yeah, I don't want to have a lengthy legal discussion. Okay, all right, never mind. Yeah. Stick my head back in the sand. <laughs> Can I just go ahead and add that I, I think the pros of this approach is that you'll have much more tangible goals and a higher completion rate, but I think one of the cons is that you're going to lose inter inter commission member communication. So actually, actually being able to like formulate ideas before they're good enough to bring to the commission is going to be lost. Um, and also, I noticed that when I asked how do we how do we start a new ad hoc subcommittee, you had brought up you'll go to your subcommittee, and that that was part of the way to get that feedback to oh. make the ad hoc subcommittee. Um, I'm sorry if I, I didn't say that, so I apologize if you thought that's what I said. Got sorry. it. Okay. So just those pros and cons as far as like what um, mm -hmm. yeah. is that loss being, is that loss worth it? Um, I guess that's what we're kind of voting on now. Right. Yeah, but I and, think we do. Have... Sorry, Michelle, please go ahead. No, you finished because I would say we have a motion. I was going to take a vote. I, yeah, I, I was just going to. One say. point. Michelle, yeah. was your objective to just get Ezra's thing moving uh, on uh, the local content? 
So I think we can, tonight we could just vote on for making that an ad hoc committee composed of his uh, did. colleagues. Did. I added it, I added it. I added did it to the memo. The memo Excellent. basically Excellent. abolishes the existing and it keeps in the work Sandino's doing, the work that those guys are doing on um, the reserves and the work that Ezra Doug and Gurkern are already doing on the uh, what they brought in today, I plus would, the local content, so it's four. I would like to add, I would amend it to not abolish the subcommittees until we hear back on the Brown Act implications yeah. to form a task a force for different motion. I'm amending yeah. yours yeah. and then, but including adding Ezra and and uh, I guess it's Ezra, Doug yeah. and Perkern uh, looking at local content. Uh, as and a, Paul, I don't think that's a, yeah, I don't think that's without merit, but I just, to me, there was a proposal and I think we ought to do a, let's see if there's support for it among four commission members and if there's not, then let's see what the next step is. Okay, let's. Okay, so the I think the motion on the floor is to accept the recommendation in the memo with the addition of the local content uh, one with Ezra. Um, correct, okay, and we had a second by Doug. Um, and so now I'm gonna have to do a roll call vote on it, correct? So Weiss is, yes. Neville. Yes. Ezra. Yep. I'm sorry, Ezra, what'd you say? Yes. Okay, thank you, Doug. Yes. <laughs> Paul. I'll say no. Okay, Ray. Yes. Kukern. No. Okay, so I believe the motion carries the two against five, four. Okay. Um, I think it's failed. Four no. votes. We've got no, two. Passed. Who who was the fifth vote? I didn't see. One, four. Two, three, four. Oh, sorry. Four four four. Five. Ray. Michelle, Donna, yeah. Ezra, Doug, Ray. Four. Five to two. Five. Right. Okay. Michelle, we have David raising hand too. Oh. That was from before, I think, but okay. Did you have something, David? Yes, yes, I did. Um, and it, I tried to get it in before, but I was a little slow. As, as to, in terms of what was voted on and approved, it what I heard, it just dealt with the abolition of the existing subcommittees and the addition of the Ezra. Other parts in that memo, were they included in that motion? This is, I'm yes. looking specifically. Yes, yes, yes. Subcommittee for the Review of Police Department Contracts, Subcommittee related to using excess water and sewer funds, and Subcommittee for Economic Analysis of Major Projects were included. Okay. What, what I was specifically asking though, there was, there was recommendations by Mayor Partita and Council Member Carson to take a look at, uh, looks like they have five proposals. Uh, does that, is that part of it or is that, that was excluded from the motion? I believe it may have been excluded, but I'm just asking for, for clarification. Yeah, Michelle, yeah. the intent was to exclude, but I think we could have clarified it, but you're right. It's, it, was, it was to basically part B of the memo was being adopted. Part B of the memo, the recommendations in part B of the memo about abolishing existing subcommittee structure with the addition of keeping those three plus the one. Thank you. Am I, am I right, Donna, that there's nothing in the Brown Act that prevents me from contacting the two other members of this commission to toss some ideas around uh, concerning, on my own, uh, concerning a particular issue. I mean, yep. for example, um, there, there is some talk about a new mailer on the, uh, uh, on, on pavement work, which Michelle and I have been doing some work on our subcommittee is abolished, but there's nothing wrong with my uh, continuing to work on that as an issue, either to bring before the commission or to discuss with staff. And, uh, and if I want to, bouncing it off another member of the commission. 
that's that's fine. As, huh? That's fine as long as the majority of the members don't deliberate outside the meeting on it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on. Thank you, Donna, very much for your work on that. Thank you, guys. I, I know this stuff is painful, but I think this is going to work well. Um, yes, thank you to me. Thank you much. Okay, let's go to number. Yay, Any wait, public wait, wait, comment wait. on thank you? <laughs> Not so fast, Michelle. No, come on, we're late. I don't like being late. Ezra's got to go see his kids. <laughs> Um, not so fast. <laughs> so, Michelle, we just wanted to, I know you made an announcement, uh, but we did want to congratulate you. And I hope you get to see the certificate that we're displaying. Very nice. Very um, and nice. <laughs> we will mail it to you. And so you'll have it. Um, we Obviously, with COVID, we can't just hand it over to you. So um, different times, but we will mail it to you. Um, I want to say thank you very much for um, being a chair and participating on the commission and for all your work and obviously the hours that you get to spend on the commission um, and <laughs> making sure it runs smoothly and um, well. Yes. So I would like to extend thank you from um, the city for you doing this work and congratulations. And we'll get to see you on other commissions, sounds like. Um, so I if anyone, know. I know we're at the end and I know everyone is trying to kind of finish the meeting, but I just wanted to make sure we take the time. And if anybody has any items to say um, to you, that would be fabulous. Uh, I know there were some words already said at the beginning um, that goes for, I guess, city staff as well as the other commission members. Great job, yeah. Michelle. Thank you for your leadership. Michelle, Thank I'd like to say Dad. something. Um, honestly, uh -oh. yeah, when I when I came on board, <laughs> you were you were the chair, and honestly, you've been a great, very supportive um, in in me feeling comfortable in this committee and this commission. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Congratulations, Michelle. It was a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Mamacita. <laughs> I want to say congratulations, Michelle, because now you're going over to planning commission where all the cool kids are. And I'm a little jealous. <laughs> um, I just want to remind the committee members that you can vote on whoever you'd like to be your next chair. It does not have to be me. Just want to remind you of that. Um, but thank you, Michelle. I know you've worked really, really hard and put a lot of a lot of effort into this. And it's it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to say uh, thanks for getting in place the rotation um, without the sorry the rotation of what does each division do uh, within the, the, the city department? I think that was hugely educational and I think it's raised all of our understanding of what some of the key issues are and what people actually do and where the money goes. So you know, I think that's gonna have a, a lasting impact on everyone here and, and, and as a result, the work that we do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna know if I need a variance, do I go to you? And, and I take, and it, get, bring your checkbook. <laughs> I oh, thought come on. <laughs> oh, she thought that I say the brown long. act one was a problem. Now I'm really in trouble. <laughs> and I'm hoping we can model a peaceful transition of power. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah. It's, it's who counts the votes. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. All right. Is there any public comment on this? We have to go to public have a public comment. comment? Um, no, not at the moment. I'm sure it's because the meeting has gone longer than expected. Okay. But okay. Um, again, Michelle, thank you very much for do for doing your work as a commissioner and as a chair. Michelle, this is this is Kelly. I just also wanted to say thank you. We've been through a lot the past number of years, and I've always appreciated your can-do attitude. So we will now just have that can-do attitude on the planning commission. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Kelly. It's been a lot of fun. All right. Now, seriously, I do have to go to public comment, don't I? Um, we checked it, and there was nobody. No, they're who... gone. Okay. Good. All right. They're gone. Thank God. Okay. And did I say that too? I am right and left in the principal's office. You want public comment? Uh, 
No, and then um, long range calendar, did everybody get a chance uh, to see that? And I should point out that right at the top of the long range calendar are the, um, uh, what uh, Councilman Carson referred to, which is the um, function of the FBC. Cause yes, that was one of the first things I wrote uh, here. So just as a reminder, that's up there. Um, any comment on long range calendar? Just to uh, give me add the paper coming back of the paper and uh, the um, the one on local content, please. <clears throat> um, Can yes, I suggest be... a, a brief agenda item for the next meeting for potential uh, tasks for subcommittees? Yes, I love it. Okay. Got that assessed. That wouldn't be, that'll be in our, oh, in Donna's discussion with staff <laughs> on things. Great. Okay. All right. No public comment because the people are gone. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, so public moved. comment on long range calendar. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Anybody? No, nobody. Okay. You tell me no one's here. Okie dokie. I move adjourn. Right, Solomon. Us, uh, second, Solomon, did we have a second? Second. Uh, Beeman seconded. Okay, so um, Weiss, yes. Donna? Aye. Yes. Was that a yes? yes? Ezra? Yes. Doug? Yes. Paul? Yes. Ray? Yes. Kern. Yes. Excellent. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much. Good night. Uh, happy good holidays. Night. Happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays, everybody. Happy Christmas. Oh, wow. Merry Christmas. God, New Year's, <laughs> all of that. Wow. Okay. Bye.